Hi, this is Mike from Microsoft Boxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video, we'll be taking a look at the super easy to install Deepcool AK620 Twin Tower, Twin Fan, Superb CPU Cooler. Keep watching to find out more. Now, that was a slightly gushing uh, intro there, despite the fact it doesn't have any RGB. So, first of all, straight out of the gate, if you're looking for a CPU cooler with a hint of RGB, move along, this is not for you. At least not yet anyway. Hopefully Deepcool may actually uh, change that in the coming months, so keep your eyes out for that one. But for today, we'll be taking a look at this. This is a non-RGB version. This is the AK620. This is a twin tower, twin fan CPU cooler with a capacity of up to 260 watts, at least that's what they say on the packaging. Now, first of all, I should say the 260 watt thing, that is for the TDP of your processor. As we kind of all know, the TDPs for processors themselves are very weirdly kind of made. And also when it comes to looking at other coolers from other brands, if you're looking at TDP recommendations, then they all test in slightly different ways. So obviously do take that into consideration. If you are gonna be comparing the 260 watts, then if you're comparing it with like with like, i.e. from the same company, then generally they'll be testing the same methods. So you'll get a good idea of how it will perform. Essentially, this is gonna be suitable for pretty much every processor that is currently on the market, except the ones that it doesn't physically fit on, of which being at the moment, LJ1700, although there will be a fitting kit for that, and also Threadripper processors. Other than that, this fits pretty much every socket from the last 10 to 15 years, so you should be absolutely fine. If you're looking for the current common ones, such as LGA1200 and also AM4, no problems at all, this is going to be absolutely fine for you. And in fact, it's possibly going to be one of the easiest processor coolers you've ever fitted. So with all that said, let's get on with this thing. Let's uh, do the unboxing. We'll go through, see what we actually get, give my opinions, etc., etc. We'll then go through, do some testing on my own personal video editing rig with a Ryzen 9 3900. We'll get some temperature tests. We'll compare it against actually one of my favorite coolers in a moment, which is the Silentium PC Fortis 5, which does extremely well. Although that is a 140 mil cooler, as opposed to this being a 120 mil base. So there's actually some stiff competition. So let's see exactly how well it does. But first of all, let's get on and unbox this sucker and see what it's all about. So first of all, as you can see from the packaging, they've actually gone for some really eco-friendly packaging here. It's all cardboard, which is easily recyclable, should you not want to keep it. And actually, it even still looks pretty nice as well. As you can see on the front there, so it's the AK620 CPU cooler, and you've got the fan shown there. It does look very, very nice. On the back of the box, it goes into some of the specifications. So I'll give you a close up there. Essentially, the kind of key ones are going to be the height and the width. So we're looking at 129 by 138 by 160, so 160 high. That is going to be something which you probably will want to consider if you are looking at getting this. Obviously, check with your motherboard and obviously check with your case to make sure that it will physically fit. At 160 mil, it's kind of towards the upper end of the size of coolers. Most ATX cases generally will be somewhere around the kind of 155 to 165 mil in terms of tolerance. So do check that before you make a purchase. But having said that, there is a little bit of flexibility on this one. So although it says 160, there potentially is a way you can make it slightly less, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we go through the unboxing. Other key things is the fan speed. So it does rate the fan speed, which is with their new FK120 mil fans at somewhere between the 500 and 1850 RPM. I've actually tested this on my system already and I've actually managed to, with the PWM control, it will go down to about 300 RPMs before it kind of loses the tachometer. So it won't go from zero to 100 to 200, but the lowest recorded one was about 300 RPM. Maximum, again, pretty much what they said, bang on 1850, so absolutely fine. And noise levels are great, they really are. Even though there's two fans and you've obviously got all that extra kind of airflow going on around there and things like turbulence, etc., it does really, really well. And I'm not sure if it's down to the waffle design of the heatsink, which we'll take a look at later. Another great selling point of this is the fact that even though it is a 120 mil style tower cooler, you've actually got six heat pipes on there as well through those twin stacks. So you're actually getting a lot of cooling performance from a relatively compact design. So let's go through and take a look and see what we actually get inside. So first of all, we've got our accessories kit, which we'll take a closer look at shortly. And we've got the tower itself. Now, the reason I'm actually pulling this out and doing it in this way is because they've taken a massive amount of care and attention to actually how this thing is packaged, which makes my life easier and is actually something else we can talk about. So looking at the packaging, they've actually gone as far as to even cut out bits of the foam where the spring clips are on the fans, so as not to damage them in transit. This is fantastic. I like that a lot. 
and it's also using that nice density foam which will help it from getting banged and bashed around in transit so so there's going to be a very small chance of this being damaged in transit i like the packaging a lot actually it even goes as far as to have an extra section on the bottom here to protect the cold plate which i think is a really nice little addition so let's start off with the accessories box now the accessories box Again, this is really good. Harking back to what I said a little bit earlier, this is probably gonna be one of the easiest coolers you've ever installed. It's very, very simple, very straightforward. In actual fact, we have got a follow-up video on this with the installation for AM4 sockets, uh, which you can click on the information tab and you'll see the link there. And it will also be in the video description. So in our first bag, we've got the AMD fittings. So in the AMD fittings, we have got two brackets. Something really nice about these brackets as well. Again, Attention to detail. Deep Cool have done a fantastic job with this. Quite often when you get these kind of wing style brackets, you look at them and if you've not used it before, you've not read the instructions, you're kind of like, oh, which way round does it go? And potentially it could go either way. But they've actually printed on the metal itself an arrow and it says CPU. So essentially, as long as you've got the arrow pointing towards the CPU, you know it's up the right way. I like that a lot. Also in the AMD bag is four mounting screws. So we're actually making use of the AM4 backplate and the AM3 backplate if you're using an AM3 system, but I think this is gonna be more towards AM4 users. So this just screws on a little bit of plastic on there to protect the motherboard so when you screw it in, and you don't need any tools or anything, you literally just tighten in hand height. Again, you'll be seeing that in the video if you check it out. Next up is the multi-bag. So this is basically a selection of parts which fits for all. And in there is some deep cool thermal compound. There is a PWM splitter, so this is going to put the two fans into one header. So if you've got a motherboard that's only got one CPU fan header, then you can just connect up one PWM style connector. Obviously, if you've got a motherboard which supports dual CPU headers, then you can plug them in separately. But that's nice that that's included anyway. And also you get the four thumb screws for attaching the brackets to the AM4 backplate. Also included is the Intel setup here. So for the Intel setup, you do have a separate backplate because obviously with Intel, normally you just use push pins. So there's a nice real solid metal backplate there and it tells you basically Intel on the back so you know what's going on. That just pushes through the board. And then there's a selection of mounting hardware. So you've got two brackets and they've got the punch outs on them which will cover things like 775, the 115X series, 201X, etc., and also LGA 1200. Also included, we do have a long reach screwdriver. So this is a Phillips head. This is actually gonna be quite useful because you actually fix the CPU cooler onto the back plates down in between the two towers. So that's actually handy for getting into it if you don't have a screwdriver suitable. And also there is a absolutely brilliant user manual or installation guide, which probably negates the need for me of done a video for it, but still I've done it regardless. So looking at the manual, it's all laid out extremely clearly, really nice and clear. You've got all the letters on there so you know which part is which. And it goes through step by step showing you how to install it for the various platforms. Absolutely brilliant, no problems there at all. So let's take a look at the actual cooler itself. And this is going to be one of those bones of contention for a lot of people. If you're into a very kind of minimalist design, this is going to tick a lot of boxes for you. If, on the other hand, you kind of like a little bit of RGB, obviously there is none. So yeah, you're going to have to wait for them to uh, include that at a later date. But for those who like the slightly more minimalist look, I think it looks really good. And from the kind of face on side, it gives you a really nice kind of square angle there, which is good. You've also got a little bit of fine detailing on these plastic covers. There, I actually thought it looked like holes, little square perforations, um, but no, it isn't. It is actually solid that's just been printed on. And also you've got the logo there, which they've actually updated. Long time ago, Deep Cool used to have uh, like a, a logo, which was two faces. And they've changed that recently to this, which I, uh, I think it looks a lot nicer and a lot more modern. If you wanted to, if you don't like the look of these toplets and you kind of want it to have that more kind of uh, rugged look or the more kind of authentic look of just seeing the actual metal, you can do that. These top covers come out, you can just pull them off. The gray section here, two screws on a Torx T8 and you can remove that and then that will expose the heat pipes and also the heat tower itself. So if you do like that look, then you can choose that should you wish to. Also, going back to what I said a little bit earlier in the video about reducing height. Now, clearly, if you look at the side of this, that section on the top is taking up a, a few millimeters. So if you remove those, you can lower the fans down slightly more and it will give you an extra couple of millimeters should you need to. Obviously, you do have heat pipes coming through the top as well, so do take that into consideration 
you aren't going to magically just suddenly get an extra kind of five or six mil straight away it's probably going to be about two or three if you take into account the heat pipes and that's going to be down to manufacturing as well whether they've been crimped or whatever on the top so i just thought i wanted to point that out mounting system for the actual fans very nice like it a lot using these really nice wire clips and they're not on particularly strongly so you can just get into them you don't need a massive amount of force and they're very easy to use that if you take them off actually shows you the really nice waffle effect they've actually got on there now, i'm not sure if this helps with the turbulence it appears to because this thing is super quiet now they rate it as being 28 decibels which is actually very hard for me to measure because the actual ambient noise in this room normally is somewhere between 30 to 40 decibels from my primitive monitor and actually at full load you still can't hear them over the other fans and things in the pc so in terms of noise very very quiet indeed and obviously at the really low rpm of around about 300 rpm effectively it's completely silent and even up to the highest speed is barely noticeable another good thing about this is because it is a symmetrical design if you take the fans out if for some reason in your particular pc you've got issues with ram clearance you can obviously you can twist this around it works either way but also you can mount the fan on any of the sides so if you want to you can have a fan on this side and if you want to you can have a fan on that side or one there one in the middle one yeah you get the general idea potentially if you want to you could even get another one of these fk120 fans and do a three fan setup if you really wanted to sounds a little bit mad but potentially if you want to again ram clearance wise that is something which is a slight consideration about this a lot of manufacturers these days have gone to that kind of asymmetric design where you've got the heat pipes kind of swoop back a little bit more or maybe a slightly narrower fan on the front this is completely symmetrical so if you do have larger ram uh, slightly like i've got in my system which i'll show you some pictures of now so you can see the ram is pretty much partially covered it doesn't actually hit it at all because there's this really nice cutout along the bottom there so the, the ram even though i've got relatively tall high profile ram it does fit underneath that ledge and also with the fan there it wasn't a problem actually installing it but it does cover the ram so if you've spent a lot of money on rgb ram sadly if you have the fan mounted on the front it is going to cover that ram or at least in most instances so also other things to look at we've got the six heat pipes on there and also we've got a copper base plate which has been nickel covered very well done feels extremely smooth to the touch kind of like baby skin it's very very soft indeed doesn't appear to be completely polished you can still see some very slight machine marks in there but they are exceptionally minimal also at the bottom you can see the two screws for mounting onto the back plates etc and also if you look very carefully down in between the middle which uh, you probably can't see from this angle but there is a screw in the middle there so some people when they're installing these types of setups you still struggle to get the tension on the spring so what you can do is you can actually loosen off that screw in the middle just to give you a little bit of extra wiggle room so let's take a closer look at the fan so again as i said the spring clips very simple and the fact they actually hold themselves in place so even shaking it around they don't want to fall off which actually aids installation so they, they don't come flying off at the uh, slightest opportunity also you've got rubber dampeners which are basically solid blocks of rubber which are front and back goes all the way through that's a really nice touch and again that's going to reduce vibration and noise and that kind of stuff and it seems to do that very well they've done a good job with the blades as well so looking at the actual frame you notice the blade vape basically goes right the way up to the end of the frame you've also got a 10 blade setup in here with an extremely high amount of static pressure looking on the back we've got the model number so this is the fk120 you've got the deep cool logo and the ratings on there 12 volt dc and 0.12 amps so no issues there even if you put a couple of these together it's not going to overload any cpu fan headers most of them tend to be at least one amp so there's plenty of scope there so that is the cooler unboxed and you've seen everything which we get so the best thing to do now is for me to go ahead and install it and then we'll come back with some facts and figures so overall this has done very well in my opinion and compared with the Celentium pc fortis 5 which was in my rig previously to this this is what i'm using it as a comparison now you will find with a lot of coolers on the market especially around this price point which is something we haven't really touched on yet at the moment here in the uk cheapest price i could find this for was 49.99 that was from scan.co.uk if you head over to amazon then you can pick this up for about 55 obviously that's going to give you shipping and all that kind of stuff included so swings and roundabouts there but somewhere around the 50 pounds mark is what you'll be expecting to pay for this and effectively it's going to give you pretty much within spitting distance 
of Noctua D15 levels of cooling performance. And actually, of all of the recent coolers I've tested, they all do generally tend to be around the same sort of figures, give or take a few degrees. Now, this is with a Ryzen 9 3900, precision boost overclocking is set to automatic, and I've just done my usual testing, so going through Cinebench, leaving that loop in for about 10 minutes or so to find our max temperatures, leaving it idling for a further five minutes to find our low temperatures, and also taking into account the Cinebench scores. So starting off with our Cinebench run, we got a score with the Fortis 5 of 18,069 points. Nice. And actually quite a drastic improvement with the Deepcool AK620. We've got a really good score of 18,323 points. Now I actually wasn't too sure about this, so I actually rerun the test a couple of times and actually got an average and basically it turned out almost identical results every single time. So that was actually good. So it means the run to run variances were well within what they should be. So yeah, we've gained, getting on for nearly 300 points in Cinebench, which is awesome. But what it really makes a difference is in temperatures, at least in my opinion anyway. So our lowest recorded temperatures on actually weirdly both coolers was 31.9 degrees Celsius. Now this is in a 24 degrees room, which is relatively stable temperature. So yeah, no issues there. Both did it in virtual silence. And my fan curves are actually set to 40% at 40, 60% at 60, and 100% at 60 degrees. So a relatively gentle curve and is well within my noise tolerance levels, which in a studio type environment is actually quite important. And it's kind of running now and you can't really tell it's on. But high temperatures is where things really did start to kick off actually. I was surprised the Fortis 5 come in at 70.3 degrees Celsius, whereas the deep cool actually beat it by a considerable margin hitting 68 degrees Celsius. Now I was a little bit unsure and I was thinking, well, maybe I've done something wrong. I did double check and I actually ran that one again as well. And yeah, 68 degrees Celsius. So almost beating it by a whole two degrees. Now two degrees isn't a lot as you well know, but if you do take into consideration the tolerances between the most expensive coolers on the market and some of the cheaper ones on the market, two degrees actually is almost the difference between the top and the bottom in terms of high performance. So this actually worked out really well. Normally I would expect to see a difference of maybe one or two degrees between a very expensive cooler and a very cheap one. But for this to perform that well on what is a relatively budget affair, 50 pounds for a twin tower twin fan CPU cooler isn't a huge amount of money. There is a lot of competition at the moment and I think that is starting to bring prices down. If you look at something like the Noctua D15, which is obviously considerably bigger and has 140 mil fans on it, that thing still costs somewhere in the region of about 90 pounds. And obviously there's other manufacturers and other coolers out there in between this kind of 50 pounds mark and heading up to those heady heights of sort of 80 to 100 pounds. So to be towards the bottom end of that, I think this actually does really well. And I would really like to test this against something slightly more budget like the Vitro V5s and the Freezer 34s. Clearly the Freezer 34 and the Vitro V5, that kind of thing, they're gonna do relatively well against it. But those are seeming to creep up in prices recently with them hitting the sort of 35 to 40 pounds mark at times. Although sometimes when they're on offer, they do come out for 20 to 25 pounds. So it depends on what the pricing is like in your region and also special offers and discounts. But for me, if you're looking to pay around about 50 pounds for a high performance CPU cooler, you don't want any RGB bling, but you want it to be as simple as physically possible to install, then I think the Deepcool AK620 is well worth a look. But what I think isn't important, what you think is, so let us know what your comments are in that section below. Would you spend 50 pounds on this? Or are you someone who likes a little bit of RGB bling? I think personally, this is a really good cooler. I like it a lot. And uh, if other manufacturers could implement this type of design for cooler installation, I think we'd all be a little bit more happier. Anyway, that's enough for now. I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. And hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.